Hello everybody and welcome. My name is John Kenton, CEO of Tech Marketeers, specialists in high-tech marketing. And today I'm honored to host our distinguished panel of experts as we discuss how you can leverage DPI in your next networking product. Before we get going, just a few technical notes. Uh, if you have any trouble reading slides and you want to make them larger, you can just grab the bottom right-hand corner and uh, slide the window. Uh, also, we will have a couple of polls during the webinar today, so if you'd like to take part in those, please make sure your pop-up blocker is uh, deactivated. At the end of the presentations, there'll be a Q&A session, so if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please submit those through the tool um, as we're going or towards the end. With that taken care of, let's get started. Uh, nearly all of our panelists, and uh, I'm quite sure many of you, are just back from Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, uh, or possibly also the uh, RSA conference in San Francisco. Wherever you know, your company is based, whether it's a carrier or, or enterprise-style company, there are, these are two of the most prestigious events on the calendar uh, for companies that develop and use technologies that run uh, and secure our fixed and mobile networks. Uh, attendance at both of these events was well up this year, and Mobile World Congress shattered previous records with a staggering 67,000 visitors from over 200 countries. I, I think that this underlines very much the overall growth that's being felt across all aspects of the networking infrastructure today. LTE understandably created an awful lot of buzz at Mobile World Congress, and recent year-end accounting showed that 2011 closed with LTE subscribers growing much faster than anticipated. And uh, if we're to believe the experts for this year, it looks like a 400,000, oh, 400,000, 400 percent increase expected uh, for the year to come. And there's no sign of things slowing down. The one thing we all know uh, is that the subscribers are not flocking to LTE for just better phone calls. Uh, it's for higher speed data and lots of it. From the recent update of Cisco's Visual Networking Index, we can see that actual mobile traffic blew away estimates for 2011 and more than doubled for the fourth year in a row. Although there is understandably a lot of focus on smartphones and the mobile infrastructure, it's not just more capable handsets and tablets that are fueling the growth, nor are the enterprise or cloud networks free from growing pains. All these mobile devices are going to have to connect to something, and in many cases that's a server or probably an application in either the public or private cloud. It's not just traffic volume that's growing, but also networks are seeing a, a much greater diversity of traffic than ever before, and this in turn is creating a need for uh, significantly increased network granularity. Security challenges are also needing to be addressed, and many of the much publicized high-profile attacks that we'd heard about were discussed even further at the RSA conference. And along with diverse topics such as cryptography, mobile security, and also hacktivism and enterprise protection, you know, there's a lot of discussion that went on at RSA. One of the themes that resonated around the conference this year was the need to be proactive rather than reactive. And the associated need for greater levels of intelligence within the network infrastructure was a, a big topic. This intelligence topic linked both events as the network intelligence was discussed from the perspective of gaining a, a much greater insight into the types of traffic profiles that are out there as well as identifying threats in a timely fashion. Collectively, the companies that are represented today here in this presentation can literally claim the world's leading telecommunications networking, security, companies uh, amongst their customer base. Before today's event, I asked the group to give me some sound bites that they got from their various customer meetings at RSA and Mobile World Congress, uh, all unattributable, of course. Here are four that I think say it all. The last one is particularly appropriate given today's topic of discussion. It seems that no matter where you are in the value chain today, getting to market faster is always very high on the, prof uh, <coughs> high on the priority list. So with that said, uh, let me get ahead and introduce the panelists today. We have a, um, a great collection uh, of people here actually from around the world. Uh, with the combination of these four companies, we bring uh, Jim St. Ledger uh, from, uh, from Intel, who's a technology marketing manager. Uh, Peter Marek from uh, Advantech Network and Communication Groups. And on the software side, we have Charlie Ashton, 
VP of Marketing for Sixwend, and Eric Larson, VP of Marketing for Cosmos. At this point, um, we'll get started. So, um, Eric, uh, how would you define network intelligence? The, the term network intelligence is some, uh, something we heard a lot in Barcelona, and it's now widely used by the telecom industry to mean detailed, real-time understanding of network traffic and subscribers. And technically, the new paradigm is that you have a new information layer between the infrastructure layer and the application layer so that you can feed information coming from the network and create this intelligence that can be used by the applications. And you see up on the left-hand corner all the different applications that requires this uh, network intelligence. Now, what's interesting is, uh, let me just get to the next slide. What's interesting is that this is made possible thanks to all this network intelligence technology. And uh, that's what we represent here, uh, the different speakers. So it's multi-core processors, it's packet processing software, packet processing platforms, and deep packet inspection. And in fact, it goes even further than DPI. And this slide is just to illustrate that uh, network intelligence technology, as we define it, is not only classifying the protocols, but also extracting metadata, such as uh, MC, MS, ISDN, IP address, traffic volume. Uh, it could be basket share for e-commerce. could be Google queries, QS, QS metrics, etc. So it's really all the information needed by different types of applications. Back to you, John. Thank you, Eric. Um, well, when we're looking at that, I guess it's a question of how um, some of the practical examples may uh, may come about from what you've just talked about. So, Charlie from Sixwin, can you give us an example? Well, John, when we, we had a number of conversations with service providers and, and network operators at Mobile World Congress last week. You know, what we hear from them is very typically they're focused on a wide range of initiatives, both, you know, to increase the average revenue per user, the ARPU, and also to reduce subscriber churn, which is a big issue for them. So these kinds of initiatives, you know, include the industry-wide shift that we see from, you know, all-you-can-eat or unlimited mobile data plans over to, to tier pricing. We also see an increasing number of, of customer-centric service offers, where you as a subscriber receive offers that are very specific to your own usage and your own applications. There's a major trend towards real-time charging and content distribution. All of this is driven by system policies. And bandwidth on demand is becoming very important. Um, sometimes this will be user-initiated, for example, if you're streaming video, or it could be just driven by the needs of the application, for example, if you're doing online gaming. And then lastly, we hear a lot now about these new freemium services, basically where the service is free when you first sign up, but fairly quickly you get hit with premium charges for, for advanced versions of the, of the game or the service. So intelligent traffic management and QoS or quality of service are very key enablers for all of these initiatives. And in mobile infrastructure equipment, this is all controlled by the policy control and enforcement function. Beyond that, DPI is absolutely fundamental technology for these services, and so we'll talk more about this now over the next few slides. And back to you, John. Okay. Right. So, you know, you said about DPI being the fundamental technology. You know, I, I'm wondering how this would uh, appear in the network. So, you know, Peter from Advantech, you know, how do you see that this network intelligence is going to get translated? Is it in the networks, in routers? edge devices or possibly even a, you know, a brand new network element? Well, John, uh, the where is really an important question. So intelligence at the edge of the networks is used in the form of traffic shaping and QoS, which are quite basic for monetizing and paid services and guaranteeing uh, user satisfaction. But those applications need to be more adaptive both towards user profiles and user applications. But in the end, the intelligence at the edge is not enough. Also, the core networks need to become smarter as well. They need to guarantee service delivery and make better use of available bandwidth. So in the end, network intelligence is becoming really pervasive. 
you can take enterprise networking as another example. The systems there also need to become faster and smarter, and especially as the services and applications now move into the cloud, the data security and the threat management is becoming a key issue. So that drives the need for scalable and virtualizable network security equipment for the data centers that actually host the clouds. And we see bladed architectures such as ATCA to have their play there. So in summary, the equipment manufacturers and solution providers need to cope with a bigger number of platforms that scale up and down. And while these platforms become smarter and more intelligent, and while the data rates keep just exploding. And that's the real major challenge, especially as the R&D resources are limited. So DPI is a basic technology that enables network intelligence. It's just a tool that allows solution providers to identify which packets in traffic are of interest. So to take an example, if you want to build a piece of video accelerating equipment that sits somewhere in a network, your first job is to identify which packets actually contain video. That's what DPI gives you. And then you can do your magic on the video traffic. So from a developer's perspective, if you're an expert in video transcoding, error correction, and caching, do you also need to understand the nitty-gritty of DPI? Or would you just want a platform that gives you right hooks uh, to do what you want, which is actually um, process the video streams? Back to you, John. Okay, so you know we're looking at processing video streams. You know you've got a lot of this DPI software there. You know that that brings up a good question for for Eric. As we're talking about DPI software, you know don't equipment manufacturers tend to develop their own in this space? Uh, yes, they used to, but there is a clear trend here. Uh, Cosmos has been uh, in this industry for a long time, and uh, over the years we've seen several generations of DPI. So you see on this slide, on the lower left-hand corner, you see the first generation, which is sort of phasing out there uh, now. And this is when people used to do uh, all this DPI internally. Then the second generation, they started to look at outsourced development tools, but we've now really entered the third generation uh, DPI, and there are some uh, new disruptive requirements. So let me just tell you a little more about what each of these, what we have observed in each of these uh, uh, generations. So the first generation was pretty easy to do because it was up to maybe one gig, uh, maybe two, three hundred protocols no metadata, and that's why most people could do it internally. Then in the second generation from about 2006, uh, people started to look for specialist technology and, and sourcing that technology uh, from people like Cosmos because this second generation DPI works at much higher speeds like uh, 10 gigs. Uh, it needs to recognize about 100, sorry, about 1,000 protocols and then extract several hundreds of metadata. And over the years, we've seen increasing outsourcing, and we're, we're now starting to see people hit the wall in terms of technology, and they realize that they don't want to spend their own engineering resources. And it's becoming so difficult because now you have to work at 40 gigs, uh, and you have to decode thousands of complex protocols and extract a large number of metadata, thousands, typically over 5,000. So, so that, that's really our expertise, and, and this is what people are looking for now. So uh, as we sort of look at that from uh, the different levels and the different generations of DPI, this would seem uh, appropriate now to be the time for our uh, first poll. So if those of you participating could take a look at the, the question on the screen, which relates to your intent to deploy DPI solutions, uh, if you could check the appropriate button. Um, and then we will uh, be polling and collate the results and be showing you those later on.
Okay, so moving on. Peter, tell us. Um, you know, we, we've looked at uh, this from the perspective of the software point of view, but from a hardware point of view, how are you seeing the, the trend where solution vendors are, are outsourcing more of their hardware technology today? Well, I just can can emphasize what Eric said that outsourcing is is a trend that's becoming more and more important, especially as we see downsized R&D departments, budget limitations, just as a result of uh, all the economy and financial crisis we're just in or through, hopefully. And the time to market race is on, and for a wider range of platforms. So we see companies really focusing on the core competency in outsourcing the other parts of a platform. But the outsourcing doesn't really stop at a hardware level. As you know, like we already said, there's a wide range of intelligence platforms that need to be developed. The total cost of ownership is becoming more and more important. And the real trend, in our opinion, is common architectures and common platforms that customers use to make it easier to migrate software from one product to another to reduce the efforts both in development but also then for product maintenance in the field. And also the middleware plays an important role in that because it can help to abstract the harder details and save time for performance and feature tuning. So common architectures even start down at a silicon level. So one of the important questions when selecting a platform is, how does a processor architecture scale to different performance price points? And how easy or difficult is it to move from one silicon generation to the next in terms of porting your code over? And how suitable is a processor for different applications and workloads? That's really the essential criteria for platform decisions these days. Well, obviously, Peter, that, that creates an, an excellent segue for, uh, for Jim over at, at Intel here. So, you know, Jim, you know, looking at the Intel Silicon, you know, how does that play uh, the appropriate role in meeting the end customer requirements, uh, specifically where DPI is concerned? Yeah, John. Well, P Peter had uh, quite a few good points on that. And I want to start by talking a little bit about know, how the market has historically approached both, you know, comms and networking platforms in general, and then to some degree by default, how they're building DPI onto those platforms and into their networks today. You know, if you look at the chart here, we're showing four different types of workloads, application control, packet, and signal. And historically, each one of those workload types has had its own architecture, had its own set of software developers with their own set of favorite tools. Um, and, of course, with their own hardware developers as well. And while this worked, you know, reasonably well in the early days of, all, you know, the dot-com bubble going up, um, after that things have gotten very tight. It's now something that's viewed largely as very inefficient and doesn't have a lot of flexibility in it. And there's lots of companies out there today that are trying to do different approaches to try to get some development efficiencies, um, software efficiencies, scalability, et cetera, some of the things that Peter talked about. And I'll share with you now um, some of the activities that Intel is doing in this space. I can get the slide to actually show. There we go. Um, in this area, we're working on something we call four-to-one workload consolidation. And what workload consolidation is really about is trying to come up with a common platform and a common architecture that will show people a way forward in a much more efficient manner. So what this is trying to do is utilize Intel architecture for all of these four workload types. This is something that can replace, you know, clearly today most of the applications are run on Intel architecture or something similar to it. Um, control plane is also a market where it's been used for a long time. And in the packet workload arena, this is something today um, that more and more we're seeing companies come over. There's something we're working on I'll talk a little bit more about later on called the Intel Data Plane Development Kit. And this enables people to go and utilize Intel architecture for packet workloads in a manner that previously they weren't familiar with it. So as you go and implement this model, you get a consolidation on a common architecture. You get software developers that now have flexibility on what projects they work on. If you have a whole bunch of new apps you want to run or services, 
on your system, you can add those. This is where DPI applications and things might fit in. If all of a sudden you need attention due to signaling, um, due to packet workloads, that might help out as well. The, the next thing I want to bring up, let me actually get through these here. My apologies for that. The next thing I want to bring up is, you know, what, what, why does this matter to customers and what ends up being relevant in the industry? And what really happens here is the fact that when you move to this common architecture approach, all of a sudden you're going to get a year-over-year -year performance improvement just based on how Intel executes to its roadmap. And this is something we call TikTok. Um, TikTok overall is an improvement either in the microarchitecture and instruction set in one year or shrinking of the transistor design and manufacturing process in the next year. And for those of you who are familiar with Intel and, uh, and our product portfolio and roadmaps, you've seen us deliver on this year over year for many, many years looking backwards. You know, I show in this one back to 45 nanometers. And of course, looking forward into the transition now, um, in this year we'll be transitioning to 22 nanometers and looking forward to 14 nanometers. So. Um, it's something that, from a development perspective, once you're on Intel architecture and you're moving all your workloads, including your DPI apps, over to it, it allows you then to ride this wave of performance improvements year over year and retain all your software investments. So it's resonating very well with customers, and I think it speaks exactly to what Peter mentioned earlier, too. So the, the, the TikTok uh, of you know the Intel strategy definitely shows the way that uh, scalability and you know uh, ongoing improvement in terms of performance uh, comes about from the silicon point of view. When it comes to the the platform level, Peter, how does the throughput and scalability tend to uh, work in that level, and how does what you offer provide enhancements in this area? For example, you know can OEMs build scalable solutions at you know different levels? Well, that's an interesting question, and especially it depends on how you define scalability as there's different angles to it. So one important aspect is how you scale from one product or one platform to another. As applications just need to be able to run on multiple product SKUs and yield the expected performance. So if you have to change the underlying platform architecture, that may yield really huge software efforts for porting and, and performance tuning, and then later on in the lifecycle management. So like Jim explained, the, the Intel Silicon and DPDK framework is one way to ease the pain here. If we look, take a different look at uh, scalability at a hardware product level, and you see a bunch of the examples of Advantech systems here in the slide, um, I'm really proud to say here that uh, Advantech offers the broadest range of products based on Intel architecture tailored for the communication space. So our products scale up from really tabletop or one year appliances which are pretty cost optimized up to really large and high performance ATCA systems. So if you look at the one year appliance, that may take you to a few tens of gigabits of throughput. A dual socket 2U machine may take you to 100 gigabit type of throughput. And if you want to go beyond that, you've probably been looking at the smaller ATCA system, something like six slot or so. And when that hits a performance bottleneck, you really need to scale up to big ATCA systems like 40 slot if you go for really high end equipment uh, yielding hundreds of gigabits of throughput. So, but it's not enough you just to scale the uh, processor horsepowers. You just need to scale I.O. in the same way. You need to scale offloading functions alike if you scale the product. So at the end of the day, DPI and network intelligence are platform technologies. They're not the real applications. So a platform also needs to be measured of how much Compute power stays available for doing the application of work if intended that runs on top of the DPI stuff. Okay, so we, you know we, we see there's a you know we've got a platform scalability model and we have the silicon scalability model, um, but you know from the software you know we've got to have that scale appropriately as well. So you know Charlie, how does this work from the 
um, software perspective, especially from the networking point of view. And you know, these hybrid configurations or ATCA platforms or a combination of Intel architecture and NPU, I mean, how does that all come together? So John, as you can see you know, from the diagram on the left here, um, in typical networking equipment, it turns out that most of the workload is data plane packet processing as opposed to control plane signaling. However, when, when you run a system like this using a typical operating system implementation, there are some very significant overheads within the OS that, that really limit the performance of that packet processing subsystem. So examples of these would be you know, preemptions, threats, threads, timers, locks, other, other OS properties. And unfortunately, these overheads are imposed on every packet in, in the flow. So this is the first challenge that our software addresses as part of the whole scalability solution. Our software, which is called uh, Six Wingate, addresses this particular problem through a dedicated fast path architecture. Uh, the, most of the packet processing functions are performed in this fast path, which is part of the data plane, but runs outside of the operating system and is fully transparent to the control plane. The result of this architecture is that in general, the Six Wind Gate software will deliver about 10 times the performance of a standard OS networking stack on packet processing functions such as IP forwarding and, and, and security. And so as one example of what that means, when we run Six Wind Gate you know, on a typical Intel Xeon processor, we can achieve a throughput of 40 gigs using only three cores on that processor, leaving the other cores available for other functions. And, and we'll talk more about that um, in a minute. As you can see from, the, from this diagram, when Six Wingate runs on a multi-core platform such as an Intel Xeon, then the fast path part of the software is configured to run on dedicated cores that only run that fast path. And those, again, are running outside of the OS. The control plane and the application software, however, are running on dedicated cores that are running Linux. So you have that separation there between the OS and the fast path. And the use of these dedicated cores for the fast path is fundamentally what enables this 10x performance acceleration that I talked about. And very importantly, the performance scales linearly with the number of cores that are configured to run the fast path. So John, you asked about support for, for hybrid systems where the data plane workload is split between an x86 platform and a network processor. And as shown on this diagram, Six Wind Gate supports this kind of hybrid configuration very efficiently. Most of the code within Six Wind Gate is actually architecture independent. And that includes the control plane synchronization module and the fast path modules. There's a limited number of architecture-specific functions, and these are abstracted into a module that we call the FastPath Networking SDK, or the FPN SDK. This is basically a zero overhead API for the FastPath modules. And within the FastPath Networking SDK, we have all of the support for on-chip crypto engines and hardware queues and other features within the processor. And we're also able to fully leverage the SDKs and the enabling software that comes from the processor manufacturers, such as the Intel DPDK that we'll get to in a couple of minutes. So in terms of scalability, um, six wind gates scale seamlessly across processors, across blades, and across racks. And, and what we mean by seamlessly is that there's absolutely no performance impact in terms of the per core uh, performance for these distributed configurations. In the example shown on the image here, you see a single instance of six wind gate serving multiple blades, in this case, multiple Avantech blades, and Peter will talk, in the, uh, talk about those in detail in a minute. We also have full support for virtualized environments, which means that Six Wind Gate can run with all of the industry standard hypervisors that are used in networking and communication equipment. And the bottom line from this scalability is that this enables the service providers to configure their equipment dynamically so they can adjust the configuration of that equipment in line with changes in network traffic and application workloads. Back to you, John. Right, Charlie. I mean, that, that brings us, you know, the, the, the foundation from the networking software, and, and we end up coming back to the DPI environment itself, which obviously in this case is with, with Eric and Cosmos. So 
Eric, from a you know a platform environment point of view, you know how does the the Cosmos software you know and, and the user get the best uh, you know the best benefit from that combination? So uh, the Cosmos IX engine, which is a DPI and metadata extraction engine, uh, works and has been optimized to work with Six Wing Gate, and uh, Charlie will describe that uh, uh, very soon. But just on the DPI side. Uh, the challenges are, first of all, the exploding bandwidth, and second, the complexity of protocols. And if you look at the exploding bandwidth first, what's important here is to have a smart third generation DPI and NI technology, which has been optimized and is integrated with other technologies. And in this case, uh, the Cosmos IX engine is integrated with six wing gate packet processing which also includes the Intel DPDK. So you get the best of breed of all those different parts which do their work at uh, the optimal level. Then in addition to that, you have all the complexity of protocols uh, where uh, I mentioned before the third generation DPI requires uh, thousands of protocol plugins that need to be updated all the time, all the metadata. And the difficulty here is the constant updates because protocols change all the time uh, without warning and without specifications. So but here somebody like Cosmos will have a dedicated reverse engineering experts that can reverse engineer a protocol and figure out how to recognize it as soon as it has changed so we can update the engine. Back to you, John. You know that's good. I mean, you, you know, you brought us back to the, the hardware again. You know, this this week um, we've had uh, the uh, Intel announce their new Romley platform. So, Jim, um, you know, we've got new features and capabilities here in Romley. I take it. How do they help improve DPI performance? Yeah, John, you're you're exactly right. So, in fact, two days ago was our corporate launch for uh, the Intel Romley platform, which. You know, those of you who, again, know Intel, know that we brand everything. It's the Intel, Intel Xeon processor E5-2600 family, which we, of course, typically call Romley. Um, you know, for us, this was the cadence in the next generation of our product. So I talked earlier about TikTok. And, you know, I'll just point out a few of the highlights on Romley. I put a link in the bottom left for those of you who are interested in learning everything about it. Um, there's a considerable amount of uh, technical collateral and other information posted at that site. But effectively, you know, we've used our design capability to add more cores to the product. So in the last generation, you had up to six cores. Now you'll have up to eight cores. We maintain the uh, dual socket capability, so you can have 16 cores total. We also maintain the hyper-threading, so you can run 32 threads on this platform. Beyond that, we've incremented additional advanced vector extensions, which are useful for things like uh, media processing, signal processing, if you're doing those kind of workloads on your platform. We've added turbo boost technology, which lets you ramp your clock speed up even higher. Um, and we're, of course, we're offering a portfolio of clock speeds from a little under 2 gigahertz to close to 3 gigahertz. Um, added more I.O. capability on it, PCI Express Gen 3, up to 40 PCI Express lanes per socket, uh, new virtualization technology, et cetera. So overall, there's a tremendous amount of improvements. Um, you know, I'll share with you one benchmark that's been shown publicly, and this is a second rate benchmark showing, you know, 67% improvement over the last generation. And what's interesting about this slide, so kind of ignore the top line numbers, but look at the trend. This is reinforcing what I mentioned earlier about Intel bringing a beat rate of improvements over time. And each generation, you're going to get an additional performance improvement. And I realize spec and rate isn't something that people are probably using for packet workloads or DPI. Um, we'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes here. But it is indicative of some of the performance enhancements you get by our improvements. Um, one other thing I, I want to mention on this one, um, and you've seen some of our press material, you might have read it. There were over 15 um, new world records in the performance area established on this platform. And while I, I typically would chalk that up to uh, too many marketing folks, um, some of the numbers in there were actually published by Cisco. So that's the kind of things I look at personally. There's one other platform that we launched about a month ago that's using the same uh, Sandy Bridge microarchitecture processors. 
Um, this is a platform we talked about on February 14th. Uh, we had a technical disclosure um, exposing a few things that are coming up later on this year. Uh, so it's using the same kind of processors, but it has a few other um, internal developments in it, such as utilization of Intel Quick Assist technology, um, and it's much more targeted at communication platforms. So you'll hear more about this both from Intel, and in fact, the ATCA blade in the middle you see there is one of the um, early development boards that Advantech is working on, so you'll certainly hear more from them as well. So, you know, you just, you just mentioned a, a couple of, of new things in here, and we've heard DPDK mentioned a, a few times in the presentation already. You know, you guys have been promoting Quick Assist and DPDK quite a lot over the last year. So, you know, how does, how does all that come together with all the uh, things we've been discussing? And above all, you know, what's the benefit to customers? Yeah, it's exactly right. And, and that, at the end of the day, is really what matters, John. You know, what benefit and value does this bring to me? as an equipment provider, equipment developer, software developer, et cetera, in the comms and networking space. And so let me talk first about our Quick Assist technology, and then I'll transition into our data plane development kit. So if, if you noticed on the prior slide when I talked about our next-gen communications platform, um, it did have a mention of Quick Assist technology. Quick Assist technology is effectively the um, software API or communication, the, the open source framework that we use to tie into services such as cryptography, uh, data compression, or pattern matching. And, you know, it's enabling both customers to build directly on them if they're writing native applications or for someone to port them over using some type of shim model or, or other or tying into the open source framework overall. And so it's got a tremendous amount of flexibility into it. Um, we've had very good uptake from customers onto it, and again, it provides a structure in which you can start developing your communication workload specifically, such as DPI and others, and then tying into the platform. The other thing I want to briefly mention is the Intel Data Plane Development Kit. So you've heard Charlie mention this, you've heard Eric mention this, et cetera. Uh, this is really a collection of software libraries and some other optimizations that our engineers and architects at Intel have done to really enable some breakthrough packet processing performance on multi-core Intel architecture. Um, I'll actually, I'll skip forward and I'll, I'll reveal my secrets with you guys, let's say. Uh, this is kind of the, I'll call it the performance chart that matters. This is showing uh, minimum size 64 byte packet layer three forwarding. Um, the bottom left number is the area for anyone who has historically said that Intel architecture can't be used for packet workloads. These are people that would take a standard Linux networking stack, um, try to do packet forwarding on them, and could barely hit a 10 gig line rate, or in fact couldn't hit um, even a 1 gig line rate in many instances, even when they're throwing 12 cores at the problem. Uh, clearly that's something that, that won't let you as an equipment developer be competitive. In tuning some of the optimizations, um, optimizing some of the buffer management, queue management, um, dealing with some of the locking issues, and switching to a polling mode driver model, We've been able to bring out over three times the throughput performance using, in fact, half of the cores than you typically would use um, on, on a former generation Westmere platform. If you then migrate that forward to the current Romley or Sandy Bridge platform that we just announced, the Xeon E5-2600, we've more than doubled that performance yet again. And you'll, you'll get a little more information on this later on. In doing that, we frankly only need a few of the cores on the platform. And again, what that does is allows you to then implement um, partitioning or virtualization technology to use other cores on your platform for control plane workloads, application workloads, or whatever you need to, again, to take advantage of the workload consolidation. So we believe that um, together between Quick Assist, the Data Plane Development Kit, and the enhancements in the silicon through our Sandy Bridge, Romley platforms, and upcoming Crystal Forest platforms, it's really helping to enable customers to build some great platforms on Intel architecture. Right, so you know we we see the performance here that you're showing. Uh, I guess more from the you know raw silicon point of view, but we've got to put the software on it. So, you know, Charlie, have you done anything that shows the performance gains that you know with DPDK and Romley, how that works at, at your level? So, John, yes, y yes, we have. Um, so, first of all, as, as this diagram shows, um, the six win gate architecture fully leverages the Intel Intel DPDK. So first of all, 6WinGate exploits the low-level DPDK data plane libraries to get the best possible utilization of the processor resources and the highest possible performance um, that way. 
Secondly, we make full use of the optimized NIC drivers that are part of DPDK in order to make sure that we get the maximum networking performance. And then finally, we have ourselves developed some optional add-ons to DPDK, which we make available to customers. These are add-ons for things like crypto acceleration, virtualization support, and various other functions which are typically used in, in networking equipment. So we then put all of this together with Six Wingate to provide a complete packet processing solution for platforms that are based on DPDK. So this complete solution contains then a full set of optimized networking protocols. We have um, you know, tens of network protocols that we make available. And all of this is fully compatible with standard Linux application APIs. So existing application software or legacy code that our customers may have, that code runs unchanged. It just runs significantly faster thanks to the performance boost that we provide here. Then all of this is delivered by Six Wind as an integrated solution that accelerates time to market for the OEMs. So the OEM doesn't need to go to Intel to get DPDK and to come to us to get Six Wind Gate. They can get the complete integrated solution available um, directly from us. So in terms of performance, this is just one example. If we talk about the Romley platform that, that Jim mentioned, um, so we've, we've done a lot of benchmarking that indicates that on a Romley platform, first of all, the performance, in this case it's IP forwarding, does scale absolutely linearly with the number of cores configured to run the fast path until that performance reaches the limit of the platform, which in this case, there's an I.O. platform limit at 86 million packets per second. And in this case, what we find is that no more than six fast path cores are needed to achieve this maximum IP forwarding rate. That then gives the developer a lot of flexibility in terms of how the other cores are used. They could be used for more complex fast path programming. They could be used for Linux, for the networking stack, for the control plane, or for the applications. Whatever makes most sense in terms of optimizing the overall performance of the system. The other benefit here when we look at the DPI use cases is that by accelerating the baseline packet processing performance, Six Wingate actually maximizes the CPU bandwidth that's available for DPI. So again, if we look at the example on the chart on the, on the slide here, this example uses a dual socket uh, Romley configuration with a total of 16 cores. When you run the networking stack using a standard operating system, then it turns out that only four of those 16 cores are available for the DPI functions. On the other hand, when you run it using Six Wingate, because of the higher performance that Six Wingate delivers, then a full 14 cores become available for DPI. So this enables significantly more advanced DPI features to be included in the product and in improved QoS functions and whatever else adds value to the OEM's product. Back to you, John. Right. So you know, as we look at that now, you know, with a lot of um, uh, a lot of the information here showing that we get uh, you know, significant improvement from Intel Silicon. We've unleashed the packet processing and the DPI software, but you know, we've got to put this on a hardware platform. So you know, Peter, a lot of these things are made from Intel reference designs. How does Advantech differentiate itself from other Intel partners? Well, surely we also use the Intel Silicon as everyone does. Um, but if all the hardware platforms were almost the same, then all of our customers' products would only differentiate in the software they use. So we believe this is not the case. Our customers need something different, and they need to differentiate. So our product strategy is based on a customization of standard products, or customized costs, as we call it. And it tries to combine the advantages of commercial off-the-shelf products with the benefits of custom designs. And I think the advantages here on the slide are, are self-explaining. And I'd rather would jump into an example on one of our product ranges, like network appliances and servers, where you can see that we start off with branding, we start off with system customization, including, of course, CPUs, memories, and all the peripherals, but also all of the I.O., the acceleration, offloading functions are subject to, to customizations. 
And look at the picture in the middle. You see a 2U standard system of Advantech, and actually the black boxes are examples of free customized systems. So for one customer, we built three different SKUs, a 1U, a 2U, and a 3U platform out of one base SKU and added some really high-end industrial design to it. So to summarize that, well, yes, we use the same silicon as the other guys, but yes, we also do differentiate as our customers need to differentiate as well. And that starts from certain design trade-offs to be made. Um, in general, Advantech designs for high performance, high reliability and usability of the product. We build a lot of uh, innovation in the products. We have scalable offload and I.O., scalable CPU power. We design in hooks for customizing the platforms afterwards from ground up. And one example you see on this slide is our fabric mezzanine concept that allows easily to customize um, ATCA blades to different needs. We have a lot of, lot of innovation and added value features we're building in, but uh, I think in the scope of this webinar, we can't go in all the details. That would lead too far. Um, for those interested, I would be happy to follow up after the webinar. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point, Peter. And, and in fact, for those of you uh, listening today, you know, at the end of the webinar, uh, we'll be able to send out all the contact information, and I do encourage you to contact the individual participants uh, with your appropriate questions. So let me just bridge this over now to, to Eric. From Cosmos's point of view, you know, the IX engine, how does, how does that stand out? Uh, yes, just a, a quick overview. It is the most widely used DPI and metadata engine today. And um, I'll let you read this, but just uh, in summary, uh, we have both technical leadership and market leadership. And we combine that with an extensive range of services like uh, architecture advice, uh, uh, POC support, integration testing services, uh, benchmarking, benchmarking and deployment assistance. And we also like to work at a strategic level uh, between our CXOs. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole of this, of this webinar has, you know, really talked a lot about the partnerships. You know, you guys are obviously working together. So, you know, from a software perspective, you know, Charlie, maybe you want to comment on, you know, how does Sixwind and, and Cosmos work together to bring uh, you know, a uh, combined solution, and you know, how does it optimize? How do you optimize together, basically? Well, John, we've seen examples, you know, where where customers have uh, been able to to get to market up to 12 months early, thanks to the integration between Six Wind Gate and and IX Engine. The diagram on the right here is actually a real customer use case. It's an analysis that one of our customers did after they developed a PCEF gateway. And they contrasted what the development flow and the development time would have been if they'd have done a custom integration of all of these functions, as opposed to the, the, the schedule acceleration that they were able to achieve by using the integration between Six Wind Gate and, and IX Engine. So there's really five major reasons that, that contribute to the, the, the schedule acceleration for the kinds of products that we're talking about here on, on the webinar. Um, the first one is the pre-integration with Intel DPDK that we already talked about. Um, the second one is all of the multi-core networking stack optimizations that are present in, in Six Wingate. Um, that avoids the need for the customer to have to put together an internal software team to figure out how to get high-performance networking protocols running on all of these advanced multi-core architectures. If they buy Six Wingate, then you know we've already provided that that capability. The pre-integration with the, the Cosmos IX engine software, again, avoids the need for the customer to have to figure out how to integrate these two different functions. Um, we've already performed that integration between Six Wind and Cosmos, so they get the immediate scheduled benefit of, of, of using an integrated solution. Um, within Six Wind Gate, we've provided extensive, extensive optimization for the Advantech blades. Taking, uh, taking into account and, 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 taking, and, and making the best use of the kind of features that Peter has been explaining. And all of this is scalable to future platforms, so customers can, deliver, can develop their, their software platform now with the confidence that that's going to scale well into the future. So when you put all of this together, you know, 
not only is it faster time to market for the OEMs, but it also significantly lowers their development risk. And over and, uh, overall, that just contributes to sustainable business growth for, for the customers. Right. Um, uh, so at this point, we want to move just quickly to our second poll, pretty self-explanatory, and if you could check the boxes now. Uh, we'd also like to point out as we're approaching um, the, last, uh, the last few sections of the presentation today, if you do have any questions, please uh, do put them into the tool. And to remind you that the slides are going to be available for downloading uh, in the on-demand version uh, within 24 hours. Um, so that, that brings us on really to, to Peter again. You know, as a, as a hardware manufacturer, you know, what, what do you bring together and try to bring this, uh, you know, combination of you, Intel, Sixwin, Cosmos, et cetera? Um, you know, they all sound great, but do you have some uh, magic bullet, as it were? Yeah, John, well, I, I need to say that we're really not moving up the food chain. We really uh, don't see any sense in becoming competitors of our own customer base. So we'd rather help our customers to master the challenges that we have discussed in this webinar and offer some getting started help here. And, and that's why we're coming up with a pre-integrated platform you see here, the Deep Packet 1. And we think it's perfect for technology evaluation, performance benchmarking, and even application development. So this platform uses the latest Xeon processes that Jim was talking about, which just have been released this week. It comes with DPD carry on it. It has 80 gig of I.O. and best-in-class middleware. So that's naturally um, six-week gate for packet processing and IX engine for DPI. It's a turnkey system and easy to operate, so our customers can get started in hours and not in weeks. So, you know, looking for an example here, I guess, you know, the, we're seeing how the Deep Packet 1 platform that Peter just talked about, you know, how, does, how do you bring the, the bundled framework together? Can you give us an example, Charles, well, John, maybe? Yeah, John, John let's look at a, a typical use case here from the mobile infrastructure area, which in this case would be a policy control and enforcement function. As you can see from the, from the, the diagram here, uh, network traffic, you know, which is typically 40 gig today and soon, soon 100 gig, um, enters the six-win gate fast pass. And the flow identification function then determines whether a packet needs to be analyzed by the Cosmos DPI engine or not. And it does that based on rules that are established in the flow table. And those rules that are all set up are all set up by the policy enforcement application. So if packet analysis is required, then the Cosmos DPI engine is called from within the six wingate gate fast path. This enables the analysis to be performed at high, the highest performance and with minimal latency because that whole call is happening within the fast path environment. Then, if the analysis determines that the flow needs to be processed by the PCEF application, six win gate then terminates the flow, and again does this within the fast path, and passes, passes it off to the policy enforcement engine. Then finally, the appropriate policy is applied by the fast path QoS function, and if necessary, the data can also be encrypted before it egresses the system. So the benefit of this kind of a flow is that, first of all, the DPI performance is maximized because the DPI engine is only called for specific patterns, for, sorry, for specific packets. And when that happens, it's called from within the fast path. Now, we found, after working with customers, that this level of integration between Six Wingate and IX engine will reduce the typical development time for an OEM from several months to just a few weeks. And obviously, that's a massive improvement. And it enables the OEM to focus their resources on their own proprietary value-added policy enforcement software, which is really how they differentiate their end product. And back to you, John. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Uh, well, you know, that brings us to the end um, of you know, the, the formal panel questions. So at this point, I'd like to hand back over to Peter, uh, who was at Vantec, have been, you know, uh, sponsoring this today, and look at a few closing remarks, and then we can move on to Q and A in a minute. So, Peter. Oh, thanks, John. So, I think we we had a lot of information on platform consolidation and enabling DPI in this webinar, uh, from a silicon level to hardware to software, and and finally a complete platform. 
And we've geared up with the best in class partners to come up with an integrated platform, the Deep Packet One, to help our customers save months in just selecting and putting an evaluation and development platform together. That is even a massive saving and uh, saves a lot of resources. So our, our Deep Packet One is really well integrated, performance optimized, and ready to go. That's really huge. But even better, it can save another year of time to market, cutting development time. That's the real cool thing, which allows our customers to leapfrog competition, and they can stay ahead of them at Intel's TikTok beat rate. Coming back to, this, to, to a slide that shows really the whole time to market pitch, which is what it's all about really, beating your competitors in time to market. That really makes a difference. So our aim is really to help the developers to be first to market with the best features and the most value add. And the Deep Packet One is also designed to scale up and evolve. So it's future proof. It will accommodate new accelerator hardware that Jim had been briefly touching on, and future Intel Silicon, of course. So Deep Packet One.